This talk is called Meteorology Basics, and it's basically going to be a 25-minute crash course in Weather 101. There's a lot of topics to talk about. We're going to try and cover them quickly and give you a high-level overview that answers some basic questions that you might have about how weather works in the atmosphere. So I'm going to talk about the vertical structure of the atmosphere, what causes weather, what are the weather circulations on the planet, jet streams, cyclones, fronts, and precipitation, everything that kind of explains how weather works on the generally the larger scales. Let's just jump right into it, starting with the vertical structure of the atmosphere. So kind of looking, there's a number of different layers to the atmosphere, but what really matters for our purpose is just this lower layer here, the troposphere, which is from the Earth's surface up to about 12 kilometers or so. And if you're flying in an airplane at cruising altitude, you're basically looking down at all the weather that occurs on Earth. And the temperature is warmest right near the surface because that's from the sun heating the Earth's surface. And then both temperature and pressure decrease with altitude throughout the troposphere and then increase again in the stratosphere this is kind of the by height diagram, and maybe sometimes this prettier one kind of shows the key point here, which is that basically from a meteorology perspective, everything that's worth talking about happens. That's not entirely, okay, I'm not entirely telling the truth there, but everything in this talk is going to be about the troposphere. Here is kind of an image of a convective cloud the tropopause, it can easily be seen by this kind of cap as air rises up in the thunderstorm, hits this invisible cap, and then spreads out. So all of weather is occurring in this relatively thin layer near the Earth's surface. And if you're kind of up in a plane above this, you're up in the stratosphere looking down at all of it, and it's too warm. As air rises, it can't go any further than this. So weather is just down near the surface. That's kind of the vertical scale, is air rising, condensing into form clouds, which then can make rain. But weather is also about horizontal motions, and those on the scale of the Earth are caused by differences in temperature, pressure, and moisture from one place to another. What causes those differences? Well, the sun angle is a big one. So the sun is more directly overhead the equator and then either more direct over the northern hemisphere in our summer and the southern hemisphere in our winter. Differences between the land and ocean cause weather because of the difference in what's called albedo or the reflectivity of different surfaces. So this ice cap, for instance, is cold and highly reflective versus a warmer ocean. And then also mountains serve as a big block and deflector of various weather patterns. So those are kind of the big ones. And we also think about weather on different spatial scales, which are called the global scale, the synoptic scale, the mesoscale, and the microscale. And for this presentation, mostly in the nature of time, I'm going to focus on the global and synoptic scale. I also believe that Many of you in this audience are experts, even more so than myself, on some of these smaller scales. So for instance, the micro scale, like the scale of your individual orchard, you all know that better than me in many cases. And it's interesting to try and connect what you're seeing at these smaller scales to the larger scales that I'm going to talk about. Looking at it globally, this image shows what we call the general circulation of the planet Earth. And again, this is driven mostly by the pole to equator difference in temperature, plus the Earth's rotation. If the Earth was not rotating, this would be a much simpler overturning circulation, basically. But because the Earth's rotation, and specifically the speed that the Earth's rotation is at relative to its radius. For instance, other planets like Jupiter, Jupiter has these bands of clouds that kind of race across the surface. Earth has a different type of general circulation because of its size and rotational speed. The big one in this diagram is the Hadley cell, which covers the lowest 30 degrees. The trade winds blow from the east in both hemispheres, and then they converge and rise and form thunderstorm activity in this band called the intertropical convergence zone near the equator. The exhaust from those thunderstorms moves poleward and then sinks in around 30 degrees north. Then in the mid-latitudes, we have westerly flow, 
this, there is technically an overturning circulation in the mid latitudes as well, but that is kind of more on average. The mid latitudes are really dominated by frontal cyclones, which we'll get to later, whereas the Hadley cell, this really is an overturning circulation. This kind of explains the location of things such as rainforests, deserts, and jet streams. So just looking at global clouds from a month ago, you can very easily see this intertropical convergence zone, this band of thunderstorms that kind of runs along the equator. You can see the dry deserts. The Sahara Desert really sticks out here, but as well as some of the other drier areas in Australia, in the United States, there's just generally less cloud cover around 30 degrees north and south. And then all these bands in the westerlies of all the frontal cyclones moving along in both hemispheres. Again, the, the general circulation is an average, but just looking at it, you can see that that's generally what is going on, just looking at a satellite image of the Earth. So jet streams. The jet streams are more of what really matters to our neck of the woods. On average, there's two of them. They're very wavy. So when you look at this cross section, for instance, generally we have our Hadley cell overturning in the lowest 30 degrees latitude. Then the subtropical jet is kind of between the Hadley and this mid latitude or ferro cell, it's sometimes called. And then the polar jet is kind of up near 50 or 60 degrees north, but oftentimes they move around where sometimes these two jets combine forces into one, sometimes they're separate. The waviness in them is really what makes weather on scales of one to two weeks or so. These big waves in the jet stream are called Rossby waves, and they're what creates the large scale weather patterns. For instance, in this diagram, this depicts generally the polar jet stream here in Northern Hemisphere winter. Sometimes the jet stream is not very wavy. We call this zonal flow. And then other times these waves develop where there's various ridges and troughs or areas of low and high pressure. There's usually four to six waves around the Northern Hemisphere, and they often stick in place for a couple weeks or so. Whereas the day-to-day -day weather, so actual cyclones kind of move along this pattern, but then these larger scale ridges and troughs tend to get stuck in place for a while. So it's these Rossby waves that determine weather a couple weeks usually. So like the big summer heat dome last year was an example of one of these big ridges, one of these big Rossby waves getting stuck over us and being especially amplified. The cold period that we had in late December, early January was another one. It lasted about two weeks again. There were several storms over the course of that cold snap. Here it is just in a loop over 10 days. So this is, this is the jet stream in the Northern Hemisphere. And this was just taken recently. It actually, the forecast, it even includes the current time. There's a lot happening, but you can kind of see here is a ridge that's kind of stuck in place over the North Pacific with various smaller waves moving along it. Here is a trough over the central US. Here is an area over the Pacific and Asia where the pattern was very zonal, not very wavy at all, just kind of moving along east to west. This is very, very difficult to forecast beyond a couple weeks or so. Then we talk more in averages. The next month will be warmer, cooler than normal, so you can kind of see where these waves move along, but there, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. It's very, it's very tricky. So this is the same 10 day period now, and this is just location of the anomalous ridges and troughs over that period. So like I showed, there was, is, is clearly very ridgy over the North Pacific in that period and troughy over Canada for the most part. And that comes out in these anomaly plots that you'll often see. This is just kind of a period where, you know, it's been cooler than normal in much of the Eastern US, but around here where the flow is kind of coming up and over this ridge, and we've mostly stayed dry. So the temperature anomalies, again, are so they're kind of in the same place as these ridges and troughs. So with this ridge, it's been warmer than normal over the North Pacific, cooler than normal over much of North America. It all kind of fits together that way. Not only are there anomalies, but the jet stream also just has a position that it prefers on average. If we had an aqua planet, which means that there was no land and only oceans, the jet stream would be a little bit more predictable. 
but it gets deflected by the mountains and the ice caps and just the differences in topography, which also create ocean currents as well. And it's also different by season. This is Northern Hemisphere winters. In winter, there tends to be a semi-permanent area of low pressure near the Aleutian Islands called the Aleutian Low. The jet stream tends to go south of that and then to the north of the semi-permanent high pressure off of California. So it basically aims the fire hose right at us on average in winter. That's our wet season. It's just kind of interesting to note in the Southern Hemisphere, there's not as many continents, right? So the jet stream is more of just kind of a band. This really shows the influence of these continents, how the semi-permanent areas of high and low pressure are influenced by these land masses, where in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a little more boring, honestly. There's, there's not as much variability. And you can see this is the summer pattern. So again, Southern Hemisphere looks pretty similar, but Northern Hemisphere, now we have high pressure over the Pacific in summer. The jet stream is weaker in summer because there's less of a difference in temperature between the equator and poles. And it tends to kind of go up and around this area of high pressure. So we have kind of have weak northerly flow in summer. There's not a lot of energy around to make weather systems. It's dry. That's our dry season. This just explains that that's kind of the reality of our wet and dry season climate around here. And where it comes from are these preferred positions and strengths of the jet stream, which are ultimately driven by this temperature difference between the equator and the poles. Ocean currents are another big part of that. And I just kind of talk about this briefly. It's another reason our weather is different than the East Coast, for instance. We have a cold current along the western side of North America, the North Pacific Gyre. The warm Gulf Stream comes up on the western side of the Atlantic. This means that the ocean temperatures are warm enough for hurricanes. Sometimes Maine or even Nova Scotia can be impacted by hurricanes. At the same latitude on our side, we will never have a hurricane because the ocean is too cold and hurricanes depend on warm ocean temperatures for energy. I guess it's good that it works out that way. It keeps our climate very moderate. It's not the summer winter difference in Boston. Well, depending on whether you like interesting weather or not, everyone has their own flavor of weather that they like. I'll leave it at that. I like the temperate climate that's west of the Cascades. Because the ocean currents matter so much, that kind of explains why we like to look at the anomalies in sea surface temperatures. They stick around much longer than the weather. So La Nina, for instance, which is these cold temperatures in the equatorial Pacific is happening right now. It's also relatively cold in the Northeast Pacific. This pattern influences the jet stream as well on average, which is why we get excited. The skiers around here get excited about La Nina winters because the weathered pattern tends to be more from the Northwest as opposed to the West or Southwest in La Nina winters, which tends to bring colder weather systems to this neck of the woods. And that has generally remained true this winter with snowpack being nearer above normal in the Cascades. If we can predict the sea surface temperature changes in advance, which we are generally fairly good at, then that gives us some predictability on a seasonal scale. Moving on. So that's kind of the global scale. Now let's talk the rest of the time about mid-latitude frontal cyclones. I've already sucked up a lot of time, so I got to move pretty quickly here. Mid-latitude frontal cyclones you're probably more familiar with than the global circulation. I wanted to spend time on that because it's interesting. The nomenclature on mid-latitude frontal cyclones you hear on TV weather broadcasts, so you're probably pretty familiar with them. But what causes them to form? They can be thought of as a density instability. There's cold, dense air up near the North Pole and warm, less dense air near the equators. Along that polar jet stream, there is also, by definition, actually, if there's this temperature gradient, there has to be a jet stream. There is this dividing line between the warmer air and the colder air, and then disturbances form along the polar front, which results in basically moving this warm, lighter air northward and the cold, denser air to the south, balancing out this instability. The systems rotate because of the Earth's rotation, and energy is released, which is weather. It's basically a conversion of potential energy to kinetic energy in many ways. Prior to cyclone formation, this is kind of a depiction of this polar front, basically. It's just 
depicted as a stationary front, but it's just kind of a band of enhanced temperature gradient. The red dashes here at temperature. So there's colder air to the left here and warmer air to the south along the front. The jet stream is associated with that temperature gradient. And the jet stream is kind of our energy source that both the jet stream and this temperature gradient are the energy sources that can be tapped into to create a frontal cyclone. So this is the life cycle of frontal cyclone. Also known as called the Norwegian frontal cyclone model. It was discovered very early on in meteorological times in the first half of the 20th century. And it's generally stood the test of time. You start with some sort of disturbance along this polar front, which forms an area of low pressure. As that area of low pressure intensifies, it results in warm air in the northern hemisphere. It's a counterclockwise rotation. Warm air moves northward to the right of the low pressure system. This northern part of the polar front becomes the warm front. The southern part becomes the cold front. And you start moving that cold air south and the warm air north. As the cyclone intensifies, low pressure continues to deepen, the fronts continue to progress. Eventually, the cold front catches up to the warm front in the mature stage, which is what's called an occlusion. This is kind of the purple occluded front section. This starts to begin to cut off the low pressure center from its source of energy, which is this temperature gradient. So the cool air is caught up to the warm air now, and the low pressure is separated from that warm air. The occlusion continues here. You start to see a new frontal boundary forming to the south of the low pressure system. And in the end, the low pressure center is completely cut off and it decays and our new front forms down here. But the net result is that warm air has been moved northward and cold air has been moved southward, which is basically what it's accomplished. That's all the horizontal motions. There's also vertical motions, which is the weather and the clouds that are depicted here. There's vertical motions both from the low pressure center itself and kind of along these fronts. Now, the other piece here, and I couldn't find it, this graphic, I think there's prettier versions of this, but the other piece I don't really have time to talk about is the connection between the jet stream here at upper levels and the intensification of this area of low pressure and its corresponding high pressure system. But basically what's going on is that the wave in the jet stream that's associated with this low pressure center amplifies as the low pressure system deepens. There's divergence downstream of a trough at upper levels, the trough being this kind of wave in the jet stream. This divergence at upper levels by conservation mass means that there needs to be convergence and rising motion at lower levels. But the divergence also moves air out of this column at upper levels, which lowers the pressure. It's all kind of connected, basically. And in a weather 101 class, you would spend a couple of days just on this. This is kind of at the heart of meteorology. It's all connected, basically. The jet stream and the high and low pressure centers are connected. Air masses move in the vertical as well as the horizontal. So we kind of have a warm air conveyor belt here which ascends over the warm front. Ascending air creates clouds and precipitation. Meanwhile, the cool dry air descends and kind of deforms and this process called diffluence occurs. Confluence or diffluence are often used to describe the motions that lead to the formation of these fronts. And frontogenesis is another term that in a real meteorology course you would talk about. But basically this lifting of this warm air in particular over the warm front, this is where the bulk of our precipitation comes from in this area. The frontal structures, again, this is kind of a repeat, but basically warm air lifting broadly over cool air, cold air, and a warm front. Cold fronts tend to be sharper. So warm fronts tend to have stratiform clouds. The precipitation lasts for a long time. Cold fronts tend to be quick and brief with stronger precipitation. And in an occluded front, uh, the cold air is kind of caught up to the cool air here, as you can see. Here's another look at, I really like this conceptual diagram of the clouds and precipitation in a mid-latitude cyclone. From A to B, here's what a cross section looks like of cross. So here's the warm, here's kind of a warm or occluded front. And if you're kind of over here, as this front approaches, usually the first sign of weather approaching is high clouds, right? Anyone who pays attention to the weather knows that you see the high clouds kind of the day before the front approaches. And as this frontal boundary eventually reaches the surface, you get deeper clouds and stronger precipitation. Atmospheric rivers kind of occur in this warm sector after the warm front has lifted. Here's the cold front. It usually has banded precipitation that's narrow and intense. 
And then if you live in Western Washington or near the coast, you're familiar with this post frontal type of precipitation, which is usually cellular and more convective due to the colder air aloft moving over the relatively warmer temperatures of the Pacific Ocean. Here's just kind of to review, here's, here's what it looks like on satellite, right? Here's the low, low pressure center kind of swirling away, usually a big old occluded front, cold front and warm front. And then if there was an atmospheric river in this case, which you would need to see the water vapor to know for sure, it would kind of be along here ahead of the cold front in this area, which is called the warm sector. So here's another example. Here is low pressure. Here's the occluded front. Here's the warm front. Here's the cold front. And then here's this atmospheric river kind of pulling moisture in. And the atmospheric river is kind of con connected to that warm conveyor belt. So here is the atmospheric river portion. And then around here, as we approach that warm front, that air gets lifted up and kind of wrapped into the low pressure center itself. A lot of this doesn't really worry about topography, right? All the cyclone model, there's no topography. But in reality, the mountains make this much more complicated. I just want to acknowledge that. In our neck of the woods, as these fronts approach our mountains, the vertical motions in the front further get modified by the mountains themselves. The lifting on the windward side of the mountains gets enhanced, which leads to even more precipitation. This descending air on the lee side, especially to the lee of the Cascades, really dries things out and it makes things messy. I think that's all the time I have. This slide has a number of resources that you can look at that I'd recommend if you want to know more. And hopefully you can reference this later or just drop me a line and I'll, I can share this. There's a number of books you can buy ranging from free to textbooky and then also a number of free websites to check out. Thanks for your attention and talk to you soon.